Um, I thought I would do something kind of odd tonight, which is just to, instead of, uh, uh, instead of setting up a lot of things, I thought that what I would do is just kind of start cold at a particular point in the book. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the book, and I, I feel like that might be a minority of people tonight, actually. Those who are not familiar with the book, um, make some notes and then ask some questions, because there's going to be a Q&A section after. And uh, there might not be a moderator. <laughs> <laughs> the trains are, are not doing so well right now. And Josh is coming from Brooklyn. So it could be a little while. Anyway, I'm going to read until you get sick of me. And then. Is there anything I should say about the book? <coughs> one of the main characters, uh, at this point, one of the main characters' hands have just been cut off. <coughs> the pain in Eddie's forearms had gotten so bad, he could only wobble forward, knock kneed. A couple of strong people held him by his armpits and guided him through the blackness. Low bushes scratched his elbows. After a minute or two, he counted everyone present by the voices. His mother, T.T., Tuck, Sirius, Michelle, and Jarvis. The car, they said, was parked about a mile away to keep the delicious people from seeing and guessing what was about to happen. They had to make the journey as silently as possible. T.T. and Darlene paused for a couple of minutes because he had some rocks and they both needed some smoky courage. Nobody had bothered to untie the sweatshirt from around Eddie's head, but that oversight increased his awareness of sounds. He noticed all sorts of night noises. Planes rumbled through the sky, bullfrogs croaked, grackles called and responded to each other, and something that might have been a deer crunched through the crops and leaves. Not only did these sensations keep his mind off the tens tension jetting up and down his arms into the space his hands used to occupy, but he couldn't find the right moment to ask someone to remove the blindfold, so he let it remain. From time to time, Sirius leaned into his ear and asked for a progress report. He said that he felt OK except for his hands, which was a joke. But nobody laughed. <laughs> Sirius apologized, promising to get him to a doctor, and asked if he would rather have kept working at the farm his whole life than lose his hands. I'd rather have lost all four limbs and my head than stay at Delicious, he told Sirius but he didn't mean it. He wanted to make up for the joke and sensed that everybody's faith in the mission rested on the belief that cutting off his hands had been the best, most logical solution to the problem, rather than something that would have occurred only to people who were out of their fucking minds. Most of them, after all, were literally on crack. Led by Sirius, with Tuck guiding the blindfolded Eddie, they hiked a faint trail that Sirius claimed to remember from the days following his escape. At first, T.T. and Michelle held Darlene up, but she insisted on supporting herself even though she had a lot of trouble doing so. Once they had traveled some distance, Eddie couldn't guess how far, it occurred to him that he didn't know what they'd done with his hands. Naturally, he couldn't have seen where they would put them, and during the process, his attention had stayed on the pain. He spent a few hundred more yards wondering about his hands. A couple of times, he craned his head back as if looking for them though that gesture made no sense, given the blindfold. Tuck appeared to guess what his movements meant. Uh-oh, he whispered. I don't know. I think your mom has them. <laughs> Somebody put them in a plastic bag. As soon as we get rolling and get far enough away, we're going to stop and get some ice, and you'll be OK. Eddie nodded, but at that moment, he could imagine that Tuck and the rest looked like old-time executioners taking him to the gallows out amid Spanish moss in the olden days. He worried that they would forget about his hands, that the appendages would stay behind and take root in the soil among the cabbage plants. They got to the Subaru after what felt like hours. Sirius untied the arms of the sweatshirt from behind Eddie's ears, and the fabric flopped down, landing partially on his shoulders. Before him, a nearly full moon hung above the horizon like a flashlight interrogating the world. A road that Eddie couldn't remember ever had seen during his time on the farm stretched out in front of him. The moonlight turned the road ashy blue, a sight so unusual that Eddie almost thought he'd invented it himself. Half-heartedly, Sirius said, 
I figured you wouldn't want to see for a while, as he took the sweatshirt off Eddie's shoulders and folded it in half. He folded the arms as well and wrapped them in the bottom half of the shirt. But this is beautiful, Eddie said, not thinking so much about the scene, but the fact that everyone would be leaving the farm. He would have smiled if he hadn't been in so much pain. I meant your, Sirius said. Eddie raised his arms up to see for the first time what he'd lost. He remembered a time when he'd worn one of his late father's shirts and his arms hadn't come all the way down. He'd skipped around the house, delighted with himself, until his mother discovered him and shook him almost hard enough to rip the shirt off his back. In the car, Eddie lay sideways in the hatchback on a filthy quilt, keeping his arms raised. T.T., Michelle, Darlene, and Tuck smashed into the back seat, Darlene on Tuck's lap, while Jarvis drove in Sirius Road shotgun. <coughs> Jarvis gunned the motor, repeatedly expressing his shock that he'd gotten himself involved in this rescue. The confusion in his voice couldn't mask the enjoyment of the crazy adventure or his implied belief that once they got through the whole thing, the mission would improve an already great story. Here is Joshua first. <laughs> Jarvis had to drive pretty slowly to navigate the bumpy road. Eddie squirmed around in the hatch and gave up on trying to rest, let alone sleep. The four in the back jostled one another in humorously uncomfortable ways. Titi's face smashed against a headrest. Michelle kept accusing and warning Tuck about the placement of his hands. An argument broke out in the back seat over whether they had gone further into the farm. During the argument, Michelle let it slip that she suspected Jarvis of working for the Fusiliers and that he might be taking them on a loop inside the farm instead of helping them get away. In a flock of half-finished sentences, she tried to explain that she knew the Fusiliers wanted to test the loyalty of everybody in the camp at any cost. She wouldn't put anything past them. If I didn't know better, she said, I might start thinking that y'all two, she pointed at Sirius and Jarvis, sacrificing her precarious balance has conspired with the growers, and any minute now could shoot everybody in the car and drive it into the river. Jarvis shrugged off the accusation at first, but then grew quiet and sober, explaining almost lovingly his astonishment at the level of paranoia that everybody took for granted. He supposed that given what he called the whole coyote scenario, cutting off someone's hands to free him from a trap, of which he didn't approve, he shouldn't have wondered that everybody had a lot of trauma. He compared the crew to soldiers coming back from an unjust war and told a story about his father's service in Vietnam. He begged everyone to trust that Sirius knew a shortcut or two and that he had, and that he had no interest in doing anything but helping. And Sirius backed him up, explaining exactly the route they meant to take in order to avoid being conspicuous or making too much noise. Jarvis found it disturbing, he said, that the workers didn't have a clear impression of the size or layout of the farm and he wondered aloud how Delicious had kept them in the dark for so many years. But to Eddie, the degree to which the workers depended on alcohol and crack cocaine should have spoken for itself, and to see such innocence in a grown man puzzled him. Why didn't he immediately recognize that drugs had vaporized half these people's brains? Michelle swore that she believed Sirius and Jarvis, but a minute later, Eddie heard her take off her seatbelt. In the silence that followed, the purr of the Subaru rose above other noises and smoothed over, over some of the edgy feeling. Michelle said that it might help if Jarvis turned the headlights off and used the moonlight instead. Jarvis, apparently eager to accommodate her, switched them, uh, tried that for a minute, then admitted that it scared him and switched them back on. <coughs> Michelle settled into her seat and evoked her close relationship with Jesus as a kind of warning to Jarvis and Sirius as if Jesus were an older brother about to pull up in his Ford Mustang and punch anybody who mistreated his sister. After a few moments, she grabbed her armrest and held it tightly. The shortcut ended and Jarvis edged the car up onto a more navigable stretch of road strewn with smaller, looser rocks. As they came near to what Sirius assured them was the edge of the property, a world they had not seen for years, a headlight, the first they'd encountered that night, barreled toward them from a distance. At first, Eddie thought it was a motorcycle, <clears throat> but as the car got closer, he saw that one light had gone out. Only a series of turns and slight hills sat between their vehicle and the approaching one. Michelle straightened her back at the sight of the headlight and shouted, pull over and cut your lights, cut your lights, pull over. Oh, come on, Michelle, Sirius said. What, what's, why, Jarvis blurted. It's the minibus. 
The mini must have done lost a headlight and they too too cheap to fix it. You motherfuckers. Minibus? Jarvis asked. Oh my god. By then, the distance had halved, and a moment later the minibus stopped in front of the middle of the road. It stopped in the middle of the road, perpendicular to traffic, its blue flank blocking the way forward like a dead cypress in a swamp. Jarvis hit the gas, prepared to make a spectacular swerve around the minibus. Michelle pushed Sirius's seat forward, mashing him in the, against the dashboard, and managed to swing the passenger door open and leap halfway out. T.T. tried to lunge over and pull her back in by the leg, but she kicked him off. The door rushed back and hit her shoulder, then jetted out again. Jarvis stomped on the brake with his whole weight, and the car halted at a diagonal 20 yards from the minibus. Sextus and Howe had already piled out and prepared themselves for a confrontation. I'll just read to the end of the chapter, so okay. It's not that much. The moment the car stopped, Michelle vaulted the rest of the way out of the car, and after running forward a few yards like somebody ready to fight, took a right turn into the rushes, churning forward with great difficulty, as though attempting to sprint through, through thigh-high water. Sextus and Howe shouted her name, begging her to come back, saying that they did not want to hurt her. But when she did not respond, Sextus removed the shotgun from under his arm and fired a warning shot into the air. Behind the steering wheel, Jarvis shrieked and a spasm visibly rippled through his body. Sirius steadied the journalist by gently placing his palm atop his sternum. Jarvis gasped. Little gems of perspiration decorated the, his forehead and the bridge of his nose. Darlene curled down behind him to avoid stray shots and told Eddie to do the same, so he scrunched onto his side in the hatch against the back of the back seat, using it as a barrier, behind which no one could see or shoot him, but from which he could peek out. Meanwhile, T.T. squeezed close next to Darlene. It seemed that Howe and Sextus, and Jackie, whose dark shadow Eddie could just make out behind a reflection in one of the minibus windows illuminated by headlights, at first thought to follow and capture Michelle as she pushed through the vegetation, but the prospect of losing the rest of the crew for her sake maybe changed their minds, and they let her run. He couldn't see whether or not Hammer lay in wait inside the minibus. Sextus petted his shotgun lovingly and chuckled. It's all gators out in that swamp, honey. Hope you know that. <coughs> he said it again, yelling loud enough that she could hear, perhaps meaning for it to discourage everyone in the Subaru as well. They all jolted in their seats when Michelle hollered something back from far away that sounded to Eddie through the open windows of the car like, Y'all the fucking gators! You! <laughs> Eddie rediscovered the quilt in the hatch and slowly edged it over his head with his forearms, leaving a small area open so that he could see past the, back, the seat back through the ribbons of seat belt and out to where Sextus and Howe stood expectantly. The two men adjusted themselves in ways that demonstrated their bravado, tugging their belt loops up, spreading their legs like cowboys. Sextus continued to stroke the shotgun, his index finger curling around the trigger. Howe touched the brim of his hat. With a phony courtesy that angered Eddie, he asked the people in the car to get out. Jarvis kept his attention focused on Sextus and Howe as he stepped out of the car with his hands at his sides, treating them like the police officers they pretended to be. Eddie stirred under the quilt, but without turning around, Darlene whispered, stay, almost like she was talking to herself. The car's idling, she said. If we don't get out, then maybe you still can. Eddie thought he could faintly hear Michelle's hands and feet pushing through the brush. Darlene, Tuck, and T.T. emerged from the back seat on the same side, and eventually Sirius came around the passenger side door. Eddie listened to everybody's feet scuffling nearer to the minibus. Jackie turned on the lights inside the van. The two doors of the Subaru stood open like the wing casings of a flying palmetto bug. Where are y'all off to on this fine evening? Sextus asked, almost cordial, cordially. But when he and Howe saw the four of them for the first time in the peculiar light created by the Subaru's lights bouncing off the minibus and the silvery moon, they both stepped back and their eyebrows rose. T.T., Tuck, and Darlene had bloodstains all over their clothes. They must have looked like a terrifying mob. What the Sam Hill? <coughs> Did y'all slaughter a bunch of my chickens? Where are these nice gentlemen taking you, Howe said, before anybody could respond. 
A few very uneasy moments passed while Howe and Sextus appeared to wait for some kind of answer from the crew, but all of them, excepting Jarvis, knew better than to give either of these men a response, truthful or sarcastic. Their silence inflated, and Eddie could, om could imagine their eyes shifting from side to side, the way they'd catch and throw back one another's sidelong glances, either gathering up the courage to make, or break, make a break for it, like Michelle, or letting the will drain out of them so that they could give out without losing face or catching a beating. <coughs> when no one spoke, Jarvis kept starting to answer, but changing his mind before a complete thought could fall out of his mouth, after which he would sigh or say, well, or um. Then Darlene, almost like a nervous flinch, leapt at Sextus and embraced the shotgun, kicking his shins and telling him to let it go. He pulled out a Glock and raised its muzzle, but Sextus, even as he lunged, ba lunged back and forth, attempting to wrestle the shotgun out of Darlene's arms, ordered him not to shoot her. Instead, Howe trained his gun on the others, though still trying to protect Sextus from Darlene, but in a matter of moments, the three others divided his attention enough to tackle him. TT in particular seemed to savor the thrashing they gave Howe. A shot reverberated through the air, then another. <coughs> Darlene had begun to howl a series of outlandish, frequently nonsensical accus accusations at Sextus. You killed my son. You tried to destroy me with your voodoo. You made Jackie control me with her pussy blood, you fucker. You tried to break me apart with your hair. You tried to keep me quiet by fucking me. Your breath put me in put prison. You tried to get inside my brain and piss your name on the inside of my skull, you fucking zombie master motherfucker. I love you! <laughs> I hate everything you've ever done, including love me, you son of a bitch. You stole my handbag and you broke my glass crystal watermelon. Give me my rocks! Kiss me. Why don't you kiss me with your mind? <laughs> fuck me with your gun, she begged. <laughs> I'm going to fuck you with your gun. Well, while the things Darlene shouted sounded like <laughs> random curses and incomprehensible bullshit a crack addict might spew during a breakdown, they were so bizarre, more bizarre than anything Eddie had ever heard come out of her mouth, even during her worst experiences with drugs, that he soon understood what he thought she meant for him to do. She was saying the first things that came to mind in order to stall them so that he could make a break for it. At the height of the brawl, Eddie looped a leg over the back seat and lay flat, then shimmied out on his elbows and knees, and using the open door to mask his movements, swung himself into the driver's seat. They hoped I would do this, he thought. They want me to. He wasn't abandoning them. He planted himself in the driver's seat of a car for the first time, as opposed to the tractor Sextus had taught him to drive. Crouching behind the wheel, he stepped on the brake and used his forearms to shift the car into drive. He saw Jackie see him. She sat up and immediately started banging on the inside of the minibus window with the flat of her hand to get everybody's attention. Eddie hugged the steering wheel, turned it with his chin, and stomped down on the gas as hard as he could. The Subaru lurched forward, and the passenger side door closed from the momentum. The driver's side door banged closed against the back end of the minibus as it cleared. Hey! Jarvis shouted. Ten miles and thirty minutes later, convinced that nobody had followed him, Eddie managed to push the headlight switch forward with his mouth and turn on the brights. In front of the car, a brazen light the color of young corn exposed the night landscape slicing through the future like a child's eyes opening on the first morning of life. I'll stop there. Listening to that chapter tonight, I, I, I thought of like early slave narratives in ways I hadn't thought of before. Mm -hmm. Was that, I mean, something about the language, something about the propulsion and the, the, the unrelenting action, was that in your thoughts before? Yeah, you yeah it was. I mean, I read a lot of um, contemporary slave narratives, <clears throat> you know, of people who have been enslaved in the modern sense. But I was also reading a lot of other... I mean, in the middle of it, I feel like in the middle of the editing is when 12 Years a Slave came out. Uh -huh. And I'm not... I think that... I was reading... There's this gigantic anthology called I Was Born a Slave. There's two volumes that are, like, both this thick. Um, and I, I, had, I still have it borrowed from my cousin. I have to give it back to her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I was trying to read through the whole thing, and that's exactly where I had stopped at um, 
at 12 at, years of flight. So, yeah, yeah, I saw the North of, and then I read that the day after I saw the movie. I was, it was it was all going through my head because I mean the yeah. idea of the book is pretty much that it brings these two, you know, slaveries together in a way that I thought they were already together, uh -huh. right? Because you know the the story is sort of based on this. Yeah. Uh, it's very not even it's actually not I shouldn't say based on because it's not based on it it's uh it was inspired in part by um uh a, an account of a woman named uh uh Joyce Grant who um who it was in a book called Nobody's by a guy named John Bow um and uh it's a true account of a woman who a black woman who was enslaved in Florida in 1992, and when I heard about that, I was like, "What the hell century is this?" Well, and those things, those things are still happening. Oh yeah, places yeah. In the South. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a particular kind of modern slavery. It's the uh, what they call the crackhead cruise, where <coughs> um, a corrupt farm will send out a van to an urban area looking for people they don't think would be missed, like drug addicts and prostitutes majority of them African-American or in some other way, like, you know, other. Um, and, and then they take them from that urban area way far away from the urban area to like some rural place. There's one, in one case, they took people from DC to just outside Jacksonville, Florida. Right. In this place called Lakeland. Right. And then, you know, once you get there, they say, oh, you know, you owe us for the ride. Like some, ex you know, incredible amount of money that you can't imagine paying. Yeah. And then, but, and it's, you know, you'll work it off. Yeah. And then you gradually discover that like, they control everything in the vicinity. They, they have like a little company store where the prices are really marked up. And then you realize that like, you're not really getting paid yeah. because you know, you get demerits for all these yeah. things. It's just nightmare. It's the return of the indentured servitude or the company store. Right, yeah. pretty much. Um, and although that, I mean, the crackhead crews, it's not the norm, right? But there are plenty of other uh, labor abuses that are going on in that sector. I actually was sort of hoping at some point that some Mexican-American writer would write about this sector because it's, the norm is really just to, you know, traffic Mexican people in, confiscate their passports, you know, with, I guess, in the hope or something, if you're that messed up, that they, they don't, you know, there's a language barrier on top of everything else, right? Mm -hmm. So they're completely isolated and, you know, and you're enslaving them as well and they can't, they really can't get out yeah. of that situation. I mean, or it's extremely difficult. There are a lot of human rights organizations that are yeah. attempting to, to do things about it, but. Well, there's an expectation in the contemporary narrative around the way that Mexican labor enters the country. In, in, in a way that the, the idea that this is happening with African American labor is not, we don't have contemporary narrative to encompass that, which I guess might be part of what inspired you to write this book. <laughs> well, see, he's really, he's really great. He's really sharp. I knew he would, he would rise to the occasion. Um, um, yes. <laughs> that, that is pretty much, I mean, I, I feel like I've had just about every conversation I've ever had before I wrote this book about slavery with anyone was about chattel slavery of, you know, of the antebellum South, like something that, you know, it's gone. We, we should get over it. It doesn't happen anymore. But, you know, after this, I was like, hmm, well, the legacy of slavery seems to be that it's not over. Yeah. So how about that? Yeah. yeah. Um, the the other thing I noticed tonight, I, I'm, I'm talking about what I noticed tonight because it's been a year since I read this book, and um, it's just such, it, things move so quickly. Well, that was Chapter a by chapter in the, yeah, that was a particular one, but, but re thinking back on. There's, I mean, a, there's a slow things, bit. Yeah, there's <laughs> a slow bit, yeah. Um, but uh, like skip, some years get skipped over. But it, it, it has something to do with the relationship between the, uh, the formal constraints, you know, the, the almost the pastiching of, uh, of slave narratives mm -hmm. and the, uh, the Scotty stuff, which I, we should right. probably talk about oh, in right. a minute. Um, 
and, uh, and, and the content. And you, you can move that quickly you know, within the constraints of a, of a slave nar narrative. You know? Right. That's true. Because it's something about how the language <coughs> just propels as opposed to, to moving inward or being framed in that contemporary scene making. Yeah, right. I mean, that yeah. scene, that, that scene is not moving that fast yeah. through time. Yeah. I think what you're talking about in a slave narrative is that, like, and then four years later, yeah. after, you know... Well, and even, in, even inside a scene, there's an and then, and then, and then, and then, even if you're moving slowly through time. Yeah. yeah. You know? There are, there are other slower, yeah. less... Yeah. That's, like, a, one of the one more... Of the yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about sincerity. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have to do it sincerely? <laughs> Not necessarily. But there's a, there's, there's a way in which certain passages in this book are, are, are directly sincere. Right. Um, and then they're, they, they smack up <coughs> against um, the Scotty sections in particular that right. are, well, we that should are probably, high irony. We should right? probably explain so let's explain the Scotty sections. For people who don't know. Yeah. Um, in some of the other sections of the book, um, there, there's a different narrator who is essentially the voice of crack cocaine, a character named Scotty. Yes. Um, and he tells the story of Darlene. He tells the story in a, in a kind of a crack cocaine patois. Well, <laughs> crack doesn't really speak. Yeah. So, I mean, I find it, it's problematic to refer yeah. to it as a crack cocaine patois. He has a particular language that is highly ironic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the, the juxtaposition between that, those two, how, how, how did that, what did that allow you to, what space did that open up for you? Um, I mean, it's funny that you, of all people, are asking me this question, because I know that you know it. Uh -huh. <laughs> because we know each other pretty uh -huh. well. Um, but, I mean, that's just what I do. Yeah. I feel like there was, there were, it was, the material is so dire in a sincere kind of way, right? So I was, I, I felt on the one hand that like this was a story that people really needed on some level to, you know, to deal with. And then once I started writing it, I, got, I felt obligated to the characters, uh -huh. which is a weird thing. It feels like, well, if I don't finish this book, then, you know, these people that I've spent all this time with, like nobody will know. And uh -huh. So I felt kind of a, almost a pressure to get through it. But then also this feeling that like, if I have to deal with it in a, in a way that's that <coughs> dire and it's just about how horrible everything is, which it is, and I feel like that, you know, I've tried to acknowledge that it's horrible, um, but I wasn't gonna be able to get it through it myself because, mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like people deal with trauma with humor a lot more in life than I've ever seen it in, hu in literature, mm -hmm. um, which was another thing that was like, oh, here's an opportunity. <coughs> To, to do something that I, that I feel like, you know, mm -hmm. could be I feel like, useful. I feel like uh, telling large portions of the story in the voice of crack cocaine complicates the meaning as well. Though. Does that, was, that, was that part of your thinking? What do you, what do you, in the, do you mean? In that in the, one could tell this story, mm -hmm. we're going to tell a story about this subject. Right. In, in, a, in a way that, uh, you know, like those uh, in a way that is very those documentaries you see right. on Netflix yeah. that end with the twenty minutes of here's what you can do. Right. You could tell the story in that way, right. and it would have one effect. Right. But uh, but the, that that seems unsatisfying to you. Um. Right. Um. Why is that? Yeah. That's what <laughs> um. I, th I mean, I don't want to write a public service announcement. Yeah. I was much more interested in making sure that this book was a work of art on its own mm -hmm. that, had, that wasn't just about, oh, this is a horrible thing you need to know about, mm -hmm. but was also had its own integrity and had its own like, thing that it was doing yeah. um, that, that would you know, make it different than that and not just you have to go do something about this. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, so that people could get through it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I didn't, I didn't want it to just be relentlessly unpleasant. Yeah. And I also had felt I had this opportunity because I invented this character who actually wasn't originally supposed to be the voice of crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. It kind of 
just I, event, and I ended up assigning this voice to crack cocaine more than you know a preconceived idea like I'm gonna tell the story in the right. voice of crack cocaine it just kind of happened yeah um, and I thought I mean I thought at first like oh nobody's gonna like that but then I was enjoying writing it so much that I was like okay this is this is a way of getting through um, and it's also a way for the reader to get through yeah. right um, and hopefully all of that all that complicated you know disturbing funny that that thing is part of the experience of reading the book I mean it's it's on a certain level, you could, it's a little bit of a love letter to my cousin, mm -hmm. Kara Walker, who designed the cover of the book. Um, How so? Well, it's just in that I've, I've known her work for a really long time, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and I've sat with a lot of those images for a very long time, yeah. and I, I get her, I know what she's up to, and there's something like, you know, in a family, yeah. Like that sense of humor is like, yeah. it's, it's she's she and I are not the only people who have this like sick sense of humor yeah. that allows us to you know explore these really difficult topics with a kind of like insouciance. Well, and and, and with a with a kind of an an edge that bucks against the received narratives. Right. Yeah. Right. Or, I mean, or makes makes those received narratives uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I think her father is is responsible for that as well. Uh -huh. um, he's a, a painter and uh, an educator, and has well, uh, he's retired now. Larry Larry Walker is his name. Um, but um, I think one of his mottos is "Fear no art." Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. And I think at a certain yeah. point he made like little buttons that said that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And was handing them around to yeah. everybody. Yeah. But he's he's basically at this point the patriarch of of the Walker family. Of right? the Walker irony. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And he's, he seems to be really encouraging of that kind of thing. He yeah. told me that like when he was starting out, he was, one of the ways he got into art was that mm -hmm. he was like drawing dirty pictures for like the school bully mm -hmm. as kind of protection. Mm -hmm. Like he would draw these dirty pictures and give them to the school bully right. and then he wouldn't like, he'd be safe. Right, right. <laughs> Um, so maybe there's questions. Oh, sure. Do, do people have questions? Yeah. So coming from the South, sometimes I read books and I, they, the accents seem hollow. Yours were spot on. So my question is, is that because of um, your, your background or did you have to do research to be able to, I mean, every voice I kept thinking, they were distinct and they were spot on. Um, it's both. It's actually, it's both my background. I consider myself, um, what is it, first generation? Like, that's the... the if you're, if you're... I always get this wrong. born in a place, you're second generation of that place. Second? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I consider myself second generation. <laughs> I'm second generation southerner. I mean, just imagine, you know, like, I was, I was born to, you know, survivors of the Holocaust. Um... And I was writing about World War II. It, to me, it's the same thing. Writing about the South as a black person in America is like writing about the Holocaust. Um, and and so, I mean, in a very particular way too, right? It's like the the people of my parents' generation fled the South essentially and um, didn't really want to talk about it afterward. Like there was all this trauma around it, and but they brought it with them, and you can kind of see it like. You know, the only three things my mother was able to make were like bread pudding, macaroni and cheese, and um, uh, sweet potato pie. The rest, like she was har a horrible cook other than that. But those three things were great. And she did them all from, she did it all from memory, right? So, and I would watch this kind of thing and I'd be like, oh, that's interesting. I can see, you can see the influence is like right on the surface and yet there's a kind of veil over it. And that made it like really fascinating to me. And then I set my first book in the South for reasons that are somewhat similar. Um, but it, it, was a, it was a book called God Says No, which is about a guy who has a lot of trouble reconciling his Christian faith and his uh, homosexuality. And um, I thought that it made more sense somehow as a story about somebody specifically from Charleston, because Charleston is like 
the, the way I would describe it is like, it's like New Orleans in a straitjacket. It's like a really lush, like sensuous city, but it's really repressed. Like all, everything is like architecturally, you know, all the buildings are like, there's they're gorgeous gardens, but there are walls like nine feet high. So like nobody can see in and it's really, so I thought like repression like is built into the, to the structure of the city. Um, so, I mean, but I, I actually have enjoyed my time in this, the, the time in the South that I've spent, um, but partially because I knew I could leave. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, not to belabor your answer to the question, but you've always had a facility with, for mimicry and, and um, making of voices and things, which is related sort of directly to right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, don't ask me to do any voices or anything. Like that. Um, over the years, it was it was a thing I used to do to entertain my family mostly, but and then it became. I did I did it to entertain my family and then to annoy downtown theater audiences. <laughs> and, uh, and now I've transferred those skills yeah. to to not writing novels. But. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. I, I it was really interesting, I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it, but sort of the decisions that Darlene makes near the end um, uh -huh. were very interesting, and I'm wondering if you always knew. There were some things I knew. I mean, I, st I wrote the book, I, I, my editor's here, so I can't say in order, <laughs> but I wrote it in the way, in the, I don't know how to say it exactly, I wrote it out of order. So, but the, the thing that is first is first, right. was the first thing I wrote. Um, or some of the few things that I wrote first were some of the things that are now. Um, but sort of later in the story, um, well, around the time you're talking about when Darlene um, makes the decisions you're talking about, yeah. that was a little less set in my mind before I started. Darlene actually is a, is, is a big question mark and never really became like, I know what she's about. Like, I just think her choices are so bad, you know? Um, but, I, but I felt on a certain level not capable of understanding. I think maybe it was good that I wasn't quite capable of understanding, like, what motivated her outside just the fact that she was in love with a drug, you know? I mean, people just do all sorts of horrible, awful things that you would never do if you were in your right mind when they're on drugs. Did, did you have an idea of where you were going in, in any, I mean, how did you, I mean, just sort of in relation to your question, did you, did you have a target you were after, or did you just sort of let the characters go wherever they went? Um, you know, what I usually do is um, I write an outline, mm -hmm. a sort of treatment of the thing that I'm, I think I'm going to do, just so that it's there, and then I go work in another document and then, like months or years later, I go back and look at the treatment. I'm like, I didn't do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think psychologically, it's good to have like this general idea of how things might go. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the book is awesome. It's uh, it's insanely entertaining for being such a dire a dire subject. Um, in, in fact, when I first heard about the book, I actually didn't realize it was based in anything real, and which makes it really horrifying. Uh, and and the fact that you're able, like there's that scene where Eddie's missing Darlene, that like I, I literally cried. I didn't think you would be able to get get there. As I'm reading it, I'm just like so engaged in the book, and like just how absurd it is and how funny it is. And then like that, that heartbreaking moment uh, when he's in, in the house alone and missing her. Um, but what I wanted to ask is uh, the, the drug thing. What did you, how did you research how Darlene would feel about the drug. What, what would you <laughs> work with that? Oh, honey. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've known people, let's say, who've had drug addictions. Um, <laughs> let's, leave, let's leave it at that. Um, but then, you know, I, I did some specific research about um, crack and crack addiction. And that's where the name Scotty came from in the, for, in the first place. That's like... <coughs> A, a street nickname for for crack, like Scotty, beam me up Scotty. So it's both a crack <laughs> reference and a Star Trek reference. 
the same time. I, I'm just going to sit over here all quiet, and then, and then you mention me. <laughs> I'm Ben George. I'm James's editor. And I'm barging in on the Scotty thing to say, <laughs> if we can get some peer pressure here, I think you should read at least like a tiny bit of the Scotty section so people can hear what this is like. And just to further embarrass James, this the book also just was named one of the top seven audiobooks of the year by Publishers Weekly. And James himself narrated it. <laughs> the part we heard was amazing, but like I think to get like the true like scope of the book. The, if you're the way that to, these voices to, to, to do and interact. To, that, that was my intention, actually. But, awesome. but I didn't want to read too long, so. I, no. yeah. All right. Well, nobody really wants to go outside, do they? <laughs> it's, it's, it's freaking cold. Um, so what I was going to do is read part of the, the, the chapter that follows the one I just read. And it's, it's called Scotty is Surprised. Can everybody hear? I feel like I'm so much more used to, like, a microphone that gives feedback and does awful things. <coughs> Hopefully I can do this. It's been a while. Once Darlene saw how and Sextus actually physically standing in the goddamn road, keeping her from quitting delicious after she had let them motherfuckers chop off her son's hands to get out, she admitted to herself that she'd been had. She felt like she'd fallen into a sinkhole right above a landfill, down into years of liquid garbage, the putrid trash of all them misreported work hours, of spraining in her ankles and breathing insecticide without no health care, of choking down undercooked and overcooked food without no nutritional value, let alone flavor, of them jacked up prices down at the depot. For a split second, Darlene left me and floated above the whole scheme, like suddenly she could see what she had did to her and everybody else it touched, and like anybody who had a second of clear thinking in the middle of a cyclone of bullshit, she lost her motherfucking mind. That's a good, that's probably a good. depends on which germ. Um, I feel like I read the account of Joyce Grant in 2006, I want to say, or seven. And then I was, but I was still working on the previous book. <clears throat> and then um, I really, I started putting stuff down in uh, June of 2008. And then I was done, when was that? The two, end of 2014, right? It was like December of, I took it away from you in yes. December of 2013. No, it was 2014. It was really close. It was very I, close. Yeah. I had to take it away from him. Right. He kept tinkering with it. That's a, that's a compliment to I you. Nick, I nicknamed him Giacometti. Because right. you, know, you know how Giacometti, who makes those like little sculptures of little men walking along? His brother had to take them away from him all the time because he would just keep like, you know, until they would be, they, they would have disappeared otherwise. You mentioned uh, that in your foremost in your mind was that uh, this be a, a legitimate uh, work of art or work of so far, you got the germ of the idea uh, and, uh, you know, judging from your first book, um, it's an area, uh, let's call it uh, humanism, that you lean towards, okay? And as a, as a person of color, uh, certainly this would be something that you'd want to focus on. What, what I, I'm interested in, I don't know if you can even answer this question, is how does, if, if I can separate those two ideas, like it's got to be a work of art, right. okay? 
and 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 the other ideas, you know, the the um, the prejudice, the the slavery of uh, mm -hmm. you know humans of of drug addiction, etc. Um, could you comment on on that? <laughs> <laughs> um, because I'm, I'm sensing that you think that they are mutually exclusive somehow, right? Like the idea that you would write about social issues and do it in, in such a way that, the, that it's funny and, you know, entertaining. I mean, it's, I mean, Gallo's humor is kind of the perfect example of that. We have lots of examples of how to do that, like, everywhere. I mean, like, look at a comedian like Richard Pryor. Not that I'm comparing myself to him, but, like, you know, or even Chris Rock. You know, any just about any comedian worth his salt will be working in territory that's exactly like that, right? Somebody who's able to take a social issue, like Lenny Bruce was like a genius of that too, right? You remember, like yeah. he, he would take a social issue and and create a confrontation in front of people about that hot button issue, and then make everybody laugh in like two minutes. And there's something that I think that is, you know really exciting about doing that and, you know, trying to do that. Um, and, and I think that's something that's, for some reason, that's where my mind always wants to go. It's like social issues and screwing with people at the same time. <laughs> well, and there's, there's layers of meaning and layers of irony. And instead of narrowing down to make its point, it opens out to present complexity, right? Hopefully, yeah. And in particular, this book. Does. I mean, that feels a lot more real to me. Yeah. You know? that's. I feel like there are far too many, you know, artists and novelists yeah. and whoever else that kind of try to narrow those things down and make them less complicated. But they are so complicated, and I don't mm -hmm. feel like I should try to represent them as anything less than that. Well, and they lose. Their Even though I have to. Yes. Yeah. Right. Like. Well, I but they lose their try. vitality as soon as they become just a message. Right, right, right. I mean, that's uh, you're reminding me of one of the things I always tell my students. Like, if somebody tells you that like there's something weird or messed up in your story, I always tell them just justify it, just mm -hmm. make sense of it, make it make sense somehow. Because there are lots of things in life that don't make sense, but somehow we accept those. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't make your story less like bland by mm -hmm. taking out this like bit of texture. Yeah. Just like just weave it in there. Okay. Um, you choose. I pick. I, I, what's like, can we do two? We got two. Sure. Okay. So on what you were just describing about the texture and not making it bland, there's an element in the novel um, that we haven't talked about tonight, but the voodoo. Oh, yeah. And you, and you read about the, the, the pussy blood was a reference to the voodoo, and then the, in the, early in the story, the, the ash that's thrown at her. Um, right. Is that an example of, that's what I was immediately thinking of when you were describing the, the texture and the because it's sort of this thread that come, pops up a couple times, but... Um, I didn't want to overdo it because it said Louisiana. Right? I didn't want it to be like, you know... A friend of mine had this club that he called the Lying Voodoo Bitches. <laughs> <laughs> and it was based on like a, a, a line in like a TV movie. It was like a bitch slap line. You lying voodoo bitch! <laughs> <laughs> we, he gave everybody names. Like everybody had a name. I'll tell you mine later. Um, Why but, later? Because it's too, it's too rude. <laughs> but I, I wanted you to talk about that a little bit. So about uh, oh right, I mean, it's the idea was sort of that racism is is a sort of um, the social fact of racism is a curse that you put on someone else's body, right? That was kind of what kept coming up for me. And there was there was actually in this in Joyce Grant's story there was actually they were doing that. There's this moment where they, they, they were working roots on the workers, like they really needed to. <laughs> they were like taking a, a menstrual blood and like trying to use it to like keep people, it was just, that was so crazy that I was like, this has to in some way inform this book. The thing that really happened. <laughs> yeah, the book. yeah. Um, and, and that's actually one of the reasons I moved it to Louisiana, because most of these cases have happened in Florida. Um, but I had this running theme of like people putting curses on each other and you know voodoo spells and that kind of thing. 
but also it's a metaphor for you know racial issues. What's number two? The voice of Scotty. Did yes. you, how did you get your head into that place and become fluent in that voice? Did you have a ritual for it, or? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I'd like to say that I watched a lot of Auntie Fee, you know, this woman who has a cooking show <laughs> on, the, on the internet. Oh, She's, but it was after, I found out about Auntie Fee after I wrote the book. <laughs> but, I mean, I grew up in Yonkers, New York, not far from here, and a lot of the women I grew up <laughs> around kind of talked like Scotty. <laughs> and so it was a voice that like, I already had heard enough that I knew, like, oh, okay, I can... You know, I can envision this. I understand how this voice works, but I had to read it over and over again a lot before I could really get it to sound to sound well. Did you edit out loud? I mean, you had to read it out loud. Yeah, to I had to read it out loud the, a lot. Yeah, to figure. Out, I mean, because there's there's a, a kind of line where it seemed like you know, oh well, Scotty wouldn't put it that way. You know, like I had to do a lot of sort of combing through. And figure not to dumb it down at all because that was it was really important to me that that voice stand up as much as the other one, you know, and maybe even be a little more perceptive or a little more sort of wise in certain ways than the other voice, the one that I was reading at first. Um, but uh, yeah, I had to do. There was a lot of work, right? Mm -hmm. If you saw the shack, you would feel less sorry for it. <laughs> but, uh, I just, yeah, I, to, get it, to get it right, that's kind of what just went over and over. And I feel like you also talked about um, how it's also important that, it, that there be some kind of slipperiness, even within itself, that it didn't always even adhere to its own kind of right. rules or right. whatever that is. Yeah, I, yeah I've, I figured that the, the way to make it really sound right was to make it, to break the rules every so often so that it didn't have that, you know, rigidity. Because that's white. That's just too white. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> James, I believe we're out of time. I, I think so, too. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. For